All righty. I'm sorry. Let me get back there. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the beautiful day today here in Preston County. We were 69 degrees today. It was quite lovely. And like you said, and everybody else said, we've seen the bees a flying, and that's always uh, fun to watch, oh, but also scary because um, it is winter and the temperatures go up and down. And it makes me nervous to see mine fly, but also excited at the same time. So um, today is all about uh, colony management. We have a lot, I, I put a lot of information on each of these slides. So if everyone could save questions till the end, if you could just jot them down so that we can get through. I, I don't want to keep people on until like 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. I don't think we'd go that long. But if we get into long discussions and then, um, and I want everybody to be able to get uh, to hear all the information. So, all right. So. I, I'm sorry, I have this little thing on my, let me get this out of the way, sorry. Okay, um, early spring management of overwinterized colonies. And this is where we're at right now. So early spring management is the main concern is sufficient food stores, um, disease and mite control. So those are the things that you're going to be, you should be worried about right now. So we're going to start with food stores. So during the winter, bees will eat stores while moving upward um, between the cones. Um, once they've reached the top of the hive, food stores are generally depleted. Um, you as a beekeeper can um, <laughs> you as a beekeeper can evaluate how much food they have in there by um, coming to the rear of the hive and lifting it slightly and seeing if you have any problems with lifting. If it's real light, you have a problem, you're going to need to feed. If you have some resistance, it's kind of heavy, but you can still move it a little bit. You really need to check. And if you can't lift it at all, you got some good stores still in there. Um, and that's just rule of thumb. That's how you want to do it without trying to crack these babies open. Um, so colonies should be assessed, but not opened until temp is at least 40 degrees or above. And really, I don't ever open them that young, know, but if you need to shove a little bit of food in there, you can just pop and shove, but you can't exam, I would never examine. Um, but best if the sun is shining, uh, like during the midday. Brood rearing can begin as early as January. So just like Sue just said, she's seen some drones in her colony. Well, that could be a, a brood that has been laid and hatched. And so definitely when you know brood is there, things have to be there in order for them to make the brood. We need plenty of food, pollen, water, all that kind of stuff has to be available for them to raise these brood, uh, to raise these bees. Uh, bees will not go down into lower box or move vertically in cold weather, even if food is present. And that sounds, what? No, there's plenty of food. I, I my first year, I brought my bees through um, winter and it was April. And unfortunately, I seen two of my hives, they, they died because, and they had food right there. And it was heartbreaking to see their little bee bodies in the little cells. Um, like they were trying to gather every last little drop of what they could. And, and they, and they just died. And I mean, I literally wanted to cry because I was like, oh my God, I starved them. How'd that happen? But there was food right there, but they wouldn't go down and get it and they didn't move. The... So unfortunately they passed and, and that, um, that's a sad, sad day when your bees don't make it. All right, come on now. Um, okay. So um, spring feeding, emergency techniques. So you've lifted these hives and 
um, you're like, oh, I got to feed. Um, techniques are including uh, feeding fondant, sugar boards, or just granulated sugar. Um, when daytime temps increase to allow easy movement of the cluster and occasional flights, syrup can be fed to prevent starvation of colonies with inadequate stores. And um, you definitely, uh, I think I heard the lady when we first got on, she said she had some of the uh, entrance feeders. Those, you can use them, but they're not recommended. You should, you should feed in the feeders inside, um, especially during these cold times when it gets cold and it'll freeze. But if it's inside the hive, you'll have better luck with that. So feeding syrup in the spring may save your feet, may, as you may save your bees from starvation. Um, but it does act as a stimulus for brood rearing and increased management will be needed. So you're gonna have to be on top of these things. Um, you're gonna have to inspect them um, and you're gonna need to make sure that they, once you start feeding, you can't stop feeding really until, or you shouldn't until um, the nectar flow starts because they don't have any food. So if you've started, you're gonna need to continue. Um, diseases, um, I'm not really gonna go into a big production on diseases because I think the ladies following me are going to go through diseases. Um, and uh, so I'm just gonna give a brief rundown. Um, so Nazima is uh, a year round risk. Um, it's a gut disease uh, for the bees. Cyanonosema are dead bees in front of the hive, um, brown or yellow streaks on the outside of your hives, like it's, it's bee poo, you know, so it's diarrhea technically. Um, and there are some things that you can use um, in preventative um, that people put this uh, fumagellin, um, you can put into um, some syrups that will uh, help the bees. Um, it's kind of a preventative thing. So American and European fowl brood are both bacterial diseases that afflict the larva in the hive. And there is treatment, the teramycin and the antibiotics. Um, and that's something that you can do. Uh, chalk brood is another, it's a fungal disease that affects the brood. Um, and causes it to become mummified. Um, it looks like, a, it literally looks like a piece of chalk in the cell. Um, really the treatment for that is strong hives. Um, they will usually fight this off. And then if you see it, you can cut it out and remove it. Um, it's, it's one that um, isn't as devastating as some of the others. Uh, but um, still keep an eye on it and, you know, be aware if it's in your um, hives. Mite and parasite control. So you always hear us talk uh, about varroa mites um, and they can affect your v bees um, with viruses that affects wing development. Um, a lot of time there's many treatments and each Beekeeper will do different things. Oxalic acid is a favorite of a lot of us. Mite away strips is some of the other. Apivar, Apigard is just to name a few, but there are, I'm sure, others out there that I'm not naming that you can do. Um, Formic Pro, I think, was one. Um, but some have greater um, greater effects. Some are some, you know, after a while they'll build up a tolerance, and you know, so you just gotta see what works and just always keep on top of, of mites because um, they will devastate your hives and, and they will kill them. Uh, the tracheal mites, they're less widespread, but they infect the trachea of the bee. Um, and the treatment on that is um, menthol pellets or they recommended uh, requeening. Now, I don't really know how and some at the end, if Phyllis and, and Deb or, or, or maybe even Susan wants to chime in for the treatment of those, 
with the menthol pellets, I'm not sure what you do with that, how you administer that. I've never had to do it. I've never had that issue, um, but I thought it, we should kind of mention it. Um, small hive beetles. Um, if high numbers of beetles are present, the colony will literally abscond. It will abandon and, and get out of there. Um, so treatment for that is beetle traps and Phyllis's favorite thing, smash them and, uh, you know, just pop them and get them out of that hive. So we don't want them in there. Um, and they 100% love pollen patties. So um, when you're putting on pollen patties, if that's something you're doing, um, watch putting too big of a pollen patty on there because it's going to draw them in because that's food. They're going to love that. So um, wax moths are very destructive. They lay eggs and then they leave. Um, the young hatch and leave this sticky white web uh, material behind in the comb. Um, treatment for that is literally strong hives. Um, and then in winter, if you have um, frames pulled, um, you can use mothballs. And then Phyllis was just talking how a lady used cedar chips down through hers. So there are some ways that you can deal with wax moths and their destruction. Um, but yeah, strong hives, they'll fight them off. They won't let them in. If they're weak hives, yeah, that's a little bit more difficult. Um, uh, I really know what the, uh, I think we, with that, just really make sure you have some strong hives. And if, if you end up with wax moths, um, you know, taking that out of the hive, um, wherever it is and getting in there and going through your, each of your, your frames and looking for them, killing them and getting out the infected um, comb is probably some of the best things that you can do. Um, making splits or, um, or, or increasing your, the amount of your colonies. So dividing strong colonies in the spring is a great way to increase your apiary um, numbers and it assists you in making up for winter losses and assists you with swarming. So they, um, in the books, all the books that I read, they say, you know, about 10% is typical winter loss, um, you know, sometimes you may come through with zero and that's luck um, and skill. I mean, there's a little bit of both that goes into that. Um, but um, making splits will help you increase that. Um, it also can assist with swarming. And does anybody know why it would help? Well, no, I'm not asking that question. I'm sorry. We'll do that at the end. Um, so it can assist with swarming um, because um, it, it breaks um, the, the hive, of course, into half, giving it more room and giving them something to do. Um, so a strong colony can be split into two smaller colonies. A queen cell or a new queen should be introduced at the time of the split. So if you go and do a split, make sure that either the one that you're splitting into the next, the second box either has a queen cell or you're ready to introduce um, a new queen into that hive. And you're gonna do that by a cage or a push cage or something. Don't just drop that queen in there because she's new and they'll kill her right away. Um, Techniques, uh, moving a split um, two miles away or a mile away until they're used to their new home can prevent them from returning to the parent hive. So when you split that hive, they could tend to, even though you've done everything right um, and you've moved it a little bit away, they may be able to sense their old hive and just fly right out and go back into the parent hive. And, and that's what you're not trying to have them do. So um, that is why the technique of moving the hive away from the parent hive um, can help them uh, be more comfortable in their new home. Um, reducing the entrance of a new colony can help um, assist them with robbing 
and feeding that new colony um, comb honey or sugar syrup for up to six weeks. As, as they're a new colony, they don't have a lot of resources, so you're the one that's going to manage that for them um, so that uh, they get off on their best foot forward. So you can split into a new hive box or using a double screen board. So you don't so there's a couple different ways when you're doing a split. So we just talked about the one where we split into a new box. This one, we're gonna use a double screen board. Um, and so it's done by placing the old queen with mostly open brood in the bottom hive. Then you're gonna add a second brood box um, with empty combs or combs of honey on top of that, placing that screened, that, that screen board um, on top of that second box with the entrance facing the opposite way. So if it's, if your, your front entrance is here, this one has to be behind uh, to the back of the hive. Um, place the hive box five to, uh, wait, place the hive box with five to six frames of cap. Okay, so place your, when you're, when you're doing the hive box above the screen board, five to six frames of cap brood, um, two frames of pollen and honey on each side. Two thirds of the bees should be placed in the upper hive box. Um, once hatched, the new hive can, once hatched, the new hive can be removed in a few weeks later into its own location. So some of the benefits of the screen a bottom board, of, not bottom board, the screen board is it's gonna have the warmth of the existing hive down below um, and the familiarity of the hive itself, so it won't be so resistant. And then once that new queen up top is hatched, um, and then you can, again, move it to its new location and seems to accept things pretty well. Swarm management. Okay, so swarming, it's a natural, a natural instinctive behavior of honeybees. We don't like them to do it, but it's instinctual for them. So, um, however, for us, successful swarm management is essential for honey production. If your bees swarm and they leave you, um, you know, you're out. You're out. There goes money just flying away. So there's a lot of things that we want to do to prevent them from swarming. Um, what should we look at? in the colonies to help us prevent swarming. Overpopulation is gonna be one thing. If you see that you're just busting at the seams and you're putting on, and you can put on new and new and new boxes. However, if you start to see that they're making queen cells, um, there you, you need to look at some different, um, some di sorry, hi Bethany. Um, some different things. Um, so overpopulation is going to be one thing that you're going to be looking for. A failing or older queen. So that means that you're, when you go in there, you're you're not seeing or seeing very little um, brood or eggs. Poor ventilation is another thing. If they the hive is going to need good ventilation. Now, when they talked about genetic makeup, it's something I really didn't quite grasp. Um, but I guess there are when they're talking about genetic makeup, I I put a chart up in the last week's session. It talked about some of the bees who were more apt to swarming and um, some that weren't. Um, and so if if that's that's what they're talking about, and I don't have that in front of me uh, to go over that, but if you look in last week's um, presentation, there's a chart in there that talks about the genetic makeup and the characteristics of the bees and which ones are more swarm worthy and ones that aren't. Um, so how do we prevent swarming? Uh, we provide extra space. How do we do that? Colonies will need the first super um, at the time of the dandelion. So that's usually around late March, you'll start seeing them pop up. 
that's a, a clear sign that it's probably time to add some extra boxes, but you're going to be in there. You're going to be looking. I mean, it could happen sooner and it's all about inspection and working your bees and looking at them and just, just trying to figure out what they need. And um, that sometimes is difficult. And sometimes you bring friends in to go, what am I supposed to do? Um, that's why it's always good to have a mentor or a friend um, that can come and help you if you're a little bit like, I'm overwhelmed, what does this hive need? Um, uh, if you see queen cells, destroy them. Don't, unless you're making a split or you wanna raise a queen, but if not, you need to cut those queen cells out. Do not leave them in there. That is a definite sign that they're gonna swarm. And um, yeah. Uh, that's not something that you want. Uh, so there is a method and I don't think Kath, has Kathy jumped on yet by chance? All right. So there is a method that you can use um, to help prevent, <clears throat> prevent um, swarming. And I know Kathy was about to, um, I think she's going to use that this year. So I was going to ask her to talk about it. Um, but the, and I, and I don't know if I'm saying this right, the dimmery method, I believe, um, involves separating the queen from the brood and allowing for the continuation of rapid colony growth. First, you must examine all the frames of the brood in the colony and destroy all queen cells. In addition, you must relocate the queen and place her in the lower brood chamber with frames of cat brood. Then you need to collect frames of uncapped brood, eggs and larvae, and place them in a new upper brood chamber. Next, place the hive body of in empty drawn comb above the box with the queen and the open brood. Play, place a queen excluder on top of the second hive body and put the box of uncapped brood above the excluder. That's a lot, I know. Rhonda? And, yes. Um, if they go on our page and mm -hmm. they scroll down, we'll put two videos on there. And okay. he explains it very well. Okay, okay. I would, like I said, I was going to have Kathy do it. I had texted yeah. her today and asked her, um, she said she would, but she was going to be running late. And so she's a little bit later than what I thought she was going to be. So I apologize for that. But that's why I was reading it. Well, so. I think the videos will do them much better than oh, just they will. Kathy. They will. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Kathy was even going to show a video. Um, but unfortunately, oh. she wasn't here. Um, okay. So that's why I was just kind of reading it. I didn't want to gotcha. leave just just stand in there. But um so that's going to be posted or it's already there, Phyllis? Hmm. She went away. I'm not sure. Um, so evidently there's going to be some videos um, because that's a lot of steps and it'd be better for you to actually see it in process. Um, so log on at a later time when you have a little bit of time and view those videos. Um, it could um, help with um, the explanation of this method. So equalizing. Equalizing a colony uh, strength makes all call. Wait. I'm sorry. Equalizing colony strengths makes all colonies productive. Um, can aid in swarm prevention and make management easier for the rest of the year. So if you take a very strong colony and a weak colony, and then you equalize them in your apiary, you're going to um, strengthen your whole apiary um, instead of having you know, this really, really strong hive and this really, really weak hive that you have to work, 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 work and put all this time in. If you equalize them in the beginning, there's Kathy. Um, if you equalize them in the in at the beginning of your year, um, it'll, it'll be a more smoother process throughout. 
Um, so strengthen weak colonies by the exchange, exchange positions with strong colonies in the same bee yard. Um, you, you can add sealed brood for strong from strong disease-free colonies. Add queenless booster packages. So that's just a lot of bees into like a weaker hive. You can combine two weak colonies to make a stronger colony. And I've done that myself. Um, and by doing that is just papering. It's simple. You, you know, put a piece of newspaper uh, on top and uh, as they are eating down through and, and up through, they're getting used to the pheromones um, of them. Now you need to make sure that you only have one queen um, because usually when you have a weak colony, it's a, a you know, a, a decent colony and the one colony that could be queenless and then you're papering together. So combined a queenless colony with a queen right colony using that paper technique. Super easy, just lay it down, put the hive box on, you're done, the bees do the rest of the work themselves. Late spring and summer management. Um, maintain favorable brood rearing and honey storage as well as mite and disease management. This will be your concern during this time. That's what you're gonna be doing you're going to be running around your apiary. That's what you're doing the entire spring and summer. Um, you should inspect your hives every seven to 10 days, checking for queen, sign of queen, eggs, brood, making sure your queen has adequate laying space as well as space for honey and pollen. Um, a colony is ready for an additional super uh, when the previous super is half to two thirds full and bees have started sealing the honey. So those are just indicators uh, that you need another box, another super. Top supering is the most popular method of adding supers. This means you only need to, well, this means that typically you only need to look at the top hive box to determine the need for another super. Uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't look through all your boxes. This is just whether you decide to add another super or not. Um, always in, when, you're, when you're in there, inspect your boxes, take a look at your frames. You need to know whether or not you have a sign of queen cells, swarm cells, so you need to inspect. This is just talking about putting that box on top, whether I need a new one if they're running out of room. Um, you may need to bait the new super by bringing two frames of honey or nectar to the new super to draw the bees upward into the new box. Um, colonies with drawn comb immediately have space to store um, nectar and honey. And so last week we talked about um, the purchase of package bees versus nuke or nucleus hives. Um, when you buy a nucleus hive, they come with drawn combs. So there is that definite benefit. Those bees do not have to go out and um, have their, take their time drawing out comb. They already have that and then they can get to work. And so um, if, you, if you're a new beekeeper and you have no drawn comb, like I was my first year, I mean, that's what your bees are gonna be doing they're gonna be working to draw out their comb and, they, and then they will um, store honey and nectar, but it's, it's gonna take them time to draw that comb out. Um, bees can be inter introduced to work foundation either by bottom, bottom supering or by exchanging some drawn comb mixed with frames of foundation um, so that you, know, you have uh, a, a clean foundation next to a drawn out foundation, and it will stimulate them to start working that um, foundation that has um, no comb on it. Fall management. Your main concern in fall management is to prepare for winter. To bring your colonies through winter will depend on your fall management. So you have to be 
you have to be on it. You have to be looking. You have to make sure they have the proper things. Poor management will result in starvation, dead outs, and weak colonies that, to, that's going to come into spring. Um, so how are you going to prepare for this? You're going to prepare by making sure you have proper arrangement of, qui of equipment. You're going to make sure that um, you're taking off your honey supers and taking off your queen excluders and that you're getting your bees down into your brood boxes that they're going to winterize through. Um, you're going to make sure your hive has proper ventilation. Um, I've heard this a lot of times. Cold weather doesn't kill bees. Wet and cold weather kills bees. So if they get wet and they get cold, that's when um, the cold kills them. So um, they're inside, you know, 90 some degrees inside. They're keeping it warm. On the outside, it's really cold. You don't have it ventilated. It's going to perspire and that is going to get on the bees. And then the cold is going to come in and that's how it's going to kill your bees. So proper ventilation, they need that. It's, it's a definite. Adequate food stores. So 100 pounds to 125 pounds for double deeps um, is what you want to see. And if you have to feed to get them up to that, you're going to use the two to one ratio um, like for every, for every two cups of sugar, you're going to use one cup of water. So at two to one. So it's sugar water. Um, and then you're going to really be concerned with your mite control. Are you going to be putting on Apivar strips? Are you going to put some mite away strips on? Definitely, are you going to check and do mite washes and uh, to see what your mites are in your hive? Uh, colony strength. You want strong colonies to go through the winter. Um, Again, we already talked about that, removing your surplus honey supers and your queen excluders, making sure that your equipment is right in your apiary to winter through. Um, and this is all fall management. This is what you're going to do in October, November. Quilt boxes um, or wrapping of hives or frost boards for winter protection. Um, those are helpful. Um, I use quilt boxes. Uh, I went to a training that Phyllis had done with her um, group and she talked about quilt boxes and showed quilt boxes and I have been using them ever since and and they have helped my bees. Also in the quilt boxes I use the frost board and so and I use um, wood uh, the wood um, kind of chips that you get that you put in for like animals like guinea pigs and that kind of stuff chips like cedar chips but not cedar chips pine chips um, not only um, do they help with warmth but they draw moisture from in the hive the bees can get up there and kind of um, get some of the dew out of there for for water, um, but it keeps the hot, helps keep the hive dry through the winter months. And I'm, I'm a big fan of the quilt boxes. I'm not sure what everybody else uses, but everybody does something a little different. So robbing, um, careful beekeeping is the best way to combat robbing. How? So during the time of dearth, your bees are gonna be frenzied because, you know, food is scarce and they're looking and they work, 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 and they're trying to find. And so when you are working, never leave your um, combs of honey or supers exposed. Put, you know, put the, um, put the hive box down and cover it with the telescoping cover as you're going through. Work quickly, but not so much that it aggravates the bees. Um, you can work on them a little bit in the evening, um, not at dark, but in the evening. Um, you always should feed inside the hives. I've learned that the hard way. Um, unfortunately, I had that Bork, is it a Borkman? I think the Borkman yes. feeders that go on the front with that, that take the quart jars or the half gallon jars and you put them up front. <sighs> That's what I was told 
to use in my beekeeping class. And so I bought them all and I learned the hard way that it, it really was a lot of my hives would fight each other. And that's not what you want. Um, you can reduce the entrance of the hive. So there's less area to protect or guard. So your guard bees will have just less um, for these bees coming at them. They have less um, area to protect. So in the left picture, um, we're seeing a, a, a hive that's being robbed. They're being attacked and they're fighting back. And that's the kind of thing that you're going to see. And it's quite, wow, it's a battle. And here on the right, you see, you can actually see, we got some yellow jackets um, in there. And then you see bees going at it. They're just fighting because the bees that this home that has, this is their home, they don't want anybody in and everybody else wants to come in and steal what they have. So it is a fight. Um, and so on this next slide, I, I thought this was interesting. Um, so if you look at the comb here on the left side, and that would be, I don't know if you could see, yes, here you can see my little mouse. Um, here, this is comb that didn't have any, it, it didn't have anything in it, but over here had food, pollen or honey or nectar. And when this hive was robbed, you can see the difference between the two cones. So this one is chewed all up because they're in there. They don't care. They're, they're in there to steal it and take it back to their hive. So they're not going to be neat about it. So they're just ripping through this. And you see all this jagged comb that um, happened during the raid. And over here, you see nice, really pretty um, comb. That's because nothing was in it. And over here is what was robbed. So um, that's one good way for you to be able to tell that this, this hive had been attacked. Um, you can see it in their comb as well. So feeding bees. Honeybee diet consists of pollen, nectar, slash honey, and water. Protein, vitamins, minerals, and fats are obtained through pollen. Um, sugar syrup is the most common feed for bees. One-to-one -one mirrors spring nectar and can be fed to bees during the spring. Two-to-one is more sugar than water and is best for fall feeding. Now, a lot of people will just automatically do two-to-one. They like that better. And that is a, whatever you want to do is fine. Um, I did include um, a healthy bee uh, recipe. It's something that you add to your sugar waters. Um, it's kind of think of it as a B vitamin. Um, I've never made it, but I thought it was interesting and I wanted to include it. I don't know if anybody else has made this honeybee recipe. You can also buy the healthy honeybee stuff through your suppliers like Man Lake and Daydont and, and, uh, whomever else. Um, but th this is one. And then you put one teaspoon per quart of syrup and then uh, store the extra in your refrigerator and you can use it all season long. Um, so um, if that recipe is there. If, it's, if, you, if you want, if anybody has a, another recipe that they want to post, um, I think that would be great too. Um, this is the one I found, and there's many different variations of this, but this is the one that I found that I thought was interesting. Feeding the bees. Sugar candy, sugar boards, and emergency sugar. Sugar candy, re candy recipe. Five pounds of sugar, two cups of water, and a tablespoon of white vinegar. Why do we use white vinegar? It helps from um, mold. Yes, helps from mold. Um, anything in, in the hive and it'll help it so that it doesn't mold and um, yeah. Emergency sugar is like pouring granulated sugar around the hole in the inner cover uh, or spread on newspaper that has been placed on top of, um, of the frames. Um, and that is just something you need to get in there quick, easy, you gotta get them fed. 
you can do that or you can make those sugar boards and then this is this is like your sugar candy and they can get up there and eat it as as needed pollen patties um so pollen patties you can make you can buy again um pollen substitute one to one or two to one sugar substitute a tablespoon of honey be healthy um you want a firm consistency. I think I seen a video where Phyllis was making it and she used a drill and a, a paddle and was uh, making um, pollen, pollen um, patties. Um, you want it for a firm consistency that can be placed on wax paper. Uh, watch out for those hive beetles. They love this stuff. So they're gonna come after it. So, um, you know, put it on piece by piece, let those bees eat it, and then get, you can get more in there. Um, why do we feed pollen or pollen patties? Simply for brood rearing. They need this stuff in order to help raise bees and to bring along the colony. So, uh, I, I love some of these photos, so I had to include those, a lot of them. Um, this is me and Deb Main when Deb Main came out to my apiary and helped me when I was having an issue. And here we are. This is summertime, ladies. And this is how you're going to look when you come out of your bee yard. You're not going to be polished. You're going to be sweaty and gross. And but hey, it's OK. Um, we had a great time that day and I very much appreciated Deb coming out. Um, and the rest of these pictures are from the either the workshop or the retreat that the women beekeepers of West Virginia puts on. I highly recommend if you can get a spot to jump into those. I've learned so much as a beekeeper, I can't tell you. And on top of learning the friendships that I have garnered, I so much appreciate and uh, feel very fortunate um, to this day um, to be able to have so. Um, just wanted to share those. I thought that was um, fitting um, to share those at the end. And we always have a good time. You see smiling faces, even though we're all out there, hot, sweaty, gross, doesn't matter. We're smiling and we have a good time because we love our bees and we love our beekeeping ladies. So does Amen. anybody have any questions? I know it was fast and dirty, but I wanted to make sure I could get through all of this so that you had it and you can always re-watch it. Um, but there's so much information when it comes to colony management that I was just trying to get as much as I could in there. Um, so does anybody have questions? I'd first like to say thank you. You did an excellent job. Excellent. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. You're what? welcome. You wanna take it off a of screen share and we'll yeah. get back to everybody's face. Stop sharing. There we are. There we, there we go. Thank you. Um, you guys don't have any questions? This is like oh. the big stuff, ladies. This is what you're going to be looking in these hives going, oh my gosh, what do I do now? Right. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. Okay, I had one thing, an issue with, I think I'm going to try to split my hive this year, but I have a bear problem. So my bees are surrounded by electric fence. Right. I can't really move them anywhere. I would have to put up a whole nother fence and I don't have the space for that. You don't have to do that. You just have to, if, if, it, if your fence only borders what you have, like if you have four hives and it only lets you do four hives then all you have to do is extend it and that's not hard at all well i only have one hive in there right now and there's probably four feet around it all the way around and so then i go in and then but i want to open it up to maybe having three hives this year i'm probably going to buy another nook i already have the boxes i actually right. have already drawn comb frames they're right. in a plastic tub they're in my shed, so they're out in the weather. They are stored okay. pretty good. And I'm gonna open up these boxes, but I'm gonna have to put all three within this fence. And if I separate them, 
like she was talking about how if you put them too close to the mother hive they might go back over mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. or kill the queen you know so how can i fix that problem well Just they, sh they shouldn't kill the queen no you're talking about robbing but mm -hmm. if you do the split then the queen's going to go with that hive and just right. put it so when I did it last year i bought a queen for the new hive okay like that's what the guy instructed me to do he sold me a queen so i had the mother hive with half the colony and then i took the other half the colony put it in a new box with a new queen and that's the one i don't know if they killed the queen or if she took off or whatever but the queen was no longer there after about three weeks okay. and i had to just put them back together because right. i wasn't going to buy another queen it was too late in the in the season right right well to to do what you you asked about is to expand so you either have to get another stand or make a stand that all of them can fit on. Because if you only want four, then you can have one stand there and you can put, you know, I mean, my bees, they are, the girls can tell you, they are side by side by side by side. Okay. And we hardly have any problem whatsoever. Now, just like uh, Rhonda said, that when you split that hive is going to be little so you only need a little hole for them to go in and out that they can defend oh, so you don't open the whole entrance like they say not, not on a baby hive no oh okay now the other bigger stronger hives will beat it up that's yes. when they'll come in and rob them um yeah. And so, Emily, you asked a question about the entrance reducer. You you can use entrance reducers, you know, whenever you want, um, whenever you see a problem. Um, the entrance reducers, they have the small hole and the larger hole. Um, you can, I keep, I keep mine on. And then when it's really hot, I make sure that I open it up. Um, I think Phyllis keeps, you don't really use entrance reducers, do you? I don't. And if I have a problem, I gather grass. Yeah, well, there's one. And so that's and the big each, hole and that's the little hole. Yeah. 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 But I, I, you can use a handful of grass and put yeah. in there because they can chew them themselves out of that. Mm -hmm. So entrance reducers are not a must only for the babies. And yeah. that's if you set it beside a big hive. When mm -hmm. I make my nukes, I don't put entrance reducers on them unless I start seeing a problem mm -hmm. because I want that flow. To, you know, the, for the them because yeah. ventilation well, is key in there. Well, you. but I, I want them to be able to go and come and, and you know, yeah. full loaded with with honey and and stuff, and not have to wait at the door to come in. True, true. Yeah, yeah. But you know that you're on mute, you, Donna. You, Emily, that is one hundred percent. It 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 is your preference on how you want right. to do. It. Yeah. Do you right. feel like there's more the of a chance answer. of robbing when you have don't have an entrance reducer or no? I can't answer that because it all depends what's going on. Now, mm -hmm. now that that brings me something that I wanted to say. If you guys use lemongrass or honeybee healthy, you need to really watch and definitely feed inside the hive because those big hives can smell that mm -hmm. and it's an attractant. And that's mm -hmm. why they use it. So I don't use it at all in any of, of my stuff because. I, I use my honey and my pollen patties and they devour it. So, and they smell like pollen. So just, just know, I mean, they, they have things out there for I you. Learned. You don't always have to use what they say. Go ahead. I learned the hard way with honey be healthy. Close exactly. Wrong. That's what I'm saying. I've yeah. never it, used it. So, yeah, but I've seen girl. the recipe and I put it on there as uh, an option for people. But yeah, just I, be I careful. Mean, I didn't know that that actually was a problem because I've never used it. Never yeah. during a dearth. Oh, right. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Never during yeah. a dearth. Is your recipe on the website or the Facebook page, Phyllis, for your? For my pollen stuff? patties? Yeah. Yeah, that I make. Uh, 60 yeah you can yeah. you can scale it down, it down. But, yeah yeah hers is it's, in a big five gallon bucket with a and she's in there with a mixer <laughs> yeah yeah um but yes i i have that and you really don't need a to feed them a lot because i mean i feed them early because i produce bees and sell them 
but for backyard people, you don't need to, to do that until probably April. And that's, and they only need a little bit just to give them a boost. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need a, you know, a great big patty thrown at them. Like Rhonda said, you're going to end up with small hive beetles yeah. and that is yeah. not what you want. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have um, to cover when Rhonda was talking about, you know, working in a dearth, because that's usually when you're pulling honey, unfortunately, unless you can, you won't do it, but we started taking it early and then letting them fill that to save us money to, so we don't have to feed them so much, but that's, that's a whole different ball game. But, um, so when you're working there, you can put a pillowcase over them, just lay it on top of them, nothing fuzzy that they'll stick to or a feed sack. Like if you're using, cause we use our lids sometimes upside down and, and put our boxes on there. Yeah. And when you're looking in this box and this box is exposed, just throw a pillowcase or, or sheet over that. And then it calms them down. And then it takes the, the you know, the robbing out of the air. And um, there's another, there's another thing, but I think um, I'll shut up for a minute, but I do want to say this before you guys log off about um, baiting uh, a, a super, but I think I'll just do it anyway. I'll do it and then I'll shut up. Um, if you have a, a deep brood and a medium, I think, Emily, this pertains to you. Uh, we talked the other day when we were fishing and I was like, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so she's going to have a deep and then a medium, which is actually another, going to be another um, brood. But then how does she get that going? Okay. Or you have two deeps and your medium is up here, but you guys, you new beekeepers, you need, you know, something to bait them with and you don't have anything but foundation or foundationalist frames. So you take that frame that's in your medium and put it off to the, you know, put the box off to the side and take that frame and put it down in your your brood box where the deep box is and just leave it for about a week and then they will pull that out no matter what you're using foundation foundationalist whatever or waxed and then it's ready to go up at the top and then you can put it in the middle of the box and then put your super on there does that make sense to you all yeah that's a good idea but that's that's how you get um your wax drawn. Now, if you leave it in there too long, then they're going to do thrown comb on the, on the bottom. Yeah. Which is no big deal. If you're not mating, you don't need it. You can just, you can <laughs> scrape them off and use it as a mite treatment and boil it down after they're dead and uh, make some candles with it. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks for catching that. I, I wasn't even thinking about, you know, having a uh, deep on the bottom. Two different sizes. Yeah. 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 Yep. Or I would have covered that. Sorry, guys. I left that. No, that, that's good. That, that's but what I'm glad I'm that you for. jumped in on that. Yeah. There's, no, I'm glad there's so it. much that there you is. Know, is like, like it, trying to figure out what to cover and yeah. how to cover it was what was driving me absolutely nuts. I, oh, I, know. Know, I know. I kept, I had all these notes and trying to figure out what to uh, leave you with. Right. Uh, was was that was that was yeah. different you did great you touched a lot of a lot of points and that i mean yeah you know, i've never seen your presentation done so well in a beginner's class so you did You're very well talking about the um thank you rhonda oh, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> i always keep two pillowcases in my box in my right to cover i always had a couple there oh old, pillowcases that's a good idea too I use old pillowcases and they, they said fit. that she didn't yeah. say, that. say that they go yeah. they fit perfectly on top of a box she wasn't listening i wasn't i didn't hear that i heard it that's why i said yeah i have i, I, I said pillowcase or feed sack or something like that. i heard feed sack i didn't hear no. pillowcase <laughs> i keep old old tea i want the credit i want the credit okay i'm so sorry <laughs> thank you Doug. <laughs> all right kathy take it away babe my turn yeah. i think so Rhonda. Yes, is it yeah is? yeah okay so i'm going to try to show you the demory the De demory method demory yeah demory thank it's, you it's for um swarm control yes and it was devised by Ann honey producing 
and honey producing by George Demery in 1884. Look when I went into our book here that we studied on last year, it was all in diagrams and I can't do diagrams. Diagrams make me crazy. So right. I, set it, I set it up. See if I can explain it to you. Okay. All right. Hey, this is our original box. Can you all see it? Mm -hmm. I can even bring you a little closer. Where my basement. She's a strong honey producer. I like this hive. So I want to keep my same footprint though. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off my lid. My enter my inner cover. My hive super that I have going. Put that aside. And my entrance reducer. Now Phoenix. we're going to assume that queen excluder. <laughs> my queen excluder. <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to assume that my, my queen is in this bottom box. So I'm going to take off my top box and put that aside. I'm going to take this box, which is my original box, and I'm going to move it over to this right over here. So I have my still have my same footprint. My new box. I'm going to go on here. It has nine frames in it. I'm going to take one more out. We're going to take out my queen. She's on this frame and she's got lots of brood and open and open eggs on both sides. And we're going to put her right in the middle of this box all by herself. And then I have all drawn put comb in here. I'm going to take one frame and I'm going to shake some bees in there. I'm going to take another frame and shake some bees in there. Bees on the center, it's all set. Now, I'm going to, add, I'm going to add a queen excluder. Queen excluder goes here. And I'm going to add my honey supers. The honey super I just took off, it's just, they have already started the honey. I'm going to put it on. And then I'm going to put on my second honey super. I want lots of honey out of this hive. And that goes on here. Then we want some kind of a shin. And a shin has another entrance hole on it that the bees can come in and out of. Put my shin. First, I got to put my entrance reducer on up here. My queen excluder, excuse me. My queen excluder. My yeah. shim has a screen on it. I don't want a screen. I just want the shim with a hole. The shim, the hole goes in the back, so the, there's a back entrance. No, 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 Kathy. No? No, you don't use, the only thing that you do is the queen excluder. Okay, I thought they called for a shim. No, the not entrance. the one that I, I watch because okay. those... They go up and down because there's only one queen in that hive and they go up and down. Okay, so now I have queen excluder, two honey boxes, queen excluder. Now, you're going to get it really strong and you're going to take your original box, bottom box, top box, and you're going to lift it up and you're going to put it up here. And this has 10 frames of bees. I'm going to check it out so I okay. won't lead you astray. Well, we can yeah. put it back together. OK, I got my really heavy box up here, my inner cover, and my top lid. She's down here, she's got nine empty frames, drawn comb, and one frame with eggs, cat brood, and a queen. She thinks that her hive is swarmed. So this should stop any swarming. The bees will still come back up here, go all the way through the boxes and up to the top. The top has no queen. You have to go back to this top box in five days and look for queen cells. You, have, you can do a multiple things with this. You can take queen cells out and start queens. I have a queen castle, that's what I wanna do. Um, you can pull them all 
she, after that, she won't have enough eggs to make any more because she doesn't have a queen up here. So once you kill all those eggs, go back and you just got bees up here, but no queen, but she's, you still have the pheromones from down here to go up. Your original box, you have nine frames of active bees. You can um, strengthen up other hives that are weak. You can make nukes. You have nine frames to play with. You check this in five days, decide what you wanna do with those queen cells. If you kill them all, after that, she can't make any more. She won't have any young eggs to make. In about a, four weeks, they should be completely drawn out. What, what I thought you could do is with this, the way it is, when I take off my honey supers, I take it back down to the, my original two boxes. And that's yep, absolutely. the demo. Any questions? Okay. Well, I have a have a comment. Um, I went to the video that we saw, and right. he did the um, shim. Sh thank you, the shim, but it did not have a screen in it, and he put a he dropped a queen cell in there, which he should have had a queen cell. So it's really weird. Right. But but you were stopping all the bees with the with the screen. Well, I know. I said without the screen. It's, it's oh, the I'm sorry. Had right there. I said okay. Just my shim right there. Okay. You can yeah. give that top box another entrance that they go on the back if you have a shim with just the hole. Yep. Yep. My so don't cut them off is what we're saying. Right. You don't cut them off. Yeah, that was good. That, thank you. They're all that come back in here. That's why I want to keep my footprint because they're all going to come back in and they're going to work their way up again. Yep. It just gives you so many different opportunities. You should get more honey. They say that a lot more honey from what I've read. Right. And it'll stop the swarming because she's already thought she swarmed. Yep. And they'll tell you I'm a swarm queen. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Thanks. So you're going to do that on all your hives, Kathy? I'm going to do it on two of my hives. I got two hives that are gangbusters. One of them was my strongest um, honey producer last year and the year before even though the last year wasn't a really good year right um, so she's destined for it hmm. i have one high that's a deep and a and a medium i'm going to change that to two deeps so i've got a project with that one uh -uh. and then my other hive um she's got some equipment issues i got to change up a few things so i'm going to be doing something else with that so i'm going to do this with two hives and they'll keep me busy i gotcha mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. I'll keep you posted. I'll let you know about my honey. I think that's well, the nice thing about this too is once you do this and after you do whatever you want to after seven days with um you know the top box, if you want it to just you know all hatch out, whatever, then you go in and kill all the queen cells or you make splits out of that box. And so whatever after you do that, then you can leave them for two to three weeks if you have enough supers on them. Right. So that top box, if you leave it to just hatch and let it become a super, then you would take that queen excluder and that um, shim out, and then it becomes one hole, and then they can fill that deep in with, with honey. So. Yeah, yeah I don't like, want honey in that top box. I'm sorry? So. I don't want honey in that. I don't want honey in that top box, do I? Or maybe I do for you, food. You can. That's what I said. If you're not going to expand and you right. don't want any more queens, then that top box. Now, if you want to keep that as a brood box, then you can take the the brood frames out after they hatch, and then put honeycomb in it. If you want to be the anal, me, I don't care. No. So. No, and I then just, they I, will I, fill that and it'll I become a I do want to make this back to its original two boxes because I'm going to have nine frames off the original bottom that I'm going to I'm going to put nine frames in queen queen castles I hope three queen castles. Well yeah, that that's your option. I'm yeah. just saying if they don't want to that blue box can become a super. Yes. And then now you have three supers on there after you take that queen excluder out mm -hmm. then you can leave. You know, like if you wanted to go on vacation, if you did right. every hive that way. So, 
but if you're going to um, do queens and you know then after you make your split and you put that queen cell you know frame in in your new nuke then you can still leave because you have you know what 20 some days 16 days for you to to come back and and see if, if she made it back so yeah there's a lot of great options there one thing you gotta make sure is that once that one frame you put in there cannot have any queen cells whatsoever just right. a queen. good point good point yeah yeah, yeah that's that's important can yeah. that be used with an eight frame and a migratory oh, yeah. lid also yes. oh yeah yeah so the migra migratory lid you you would still put the spacer at the top yeah migratory lid spacer at the top well that I got well, shim? That? Yeah. The shim. Shim. yeah, the That's shim. What I meant to say. The only thing the shim does, it has a hole in the back and it lets that box go out. And and all that really does is because you moved and they're going to, you move the bees up, they're right. going to fly out and they're going to go down in the bottom where they think they have swarmed or, you know, whatever. And yeah. then, and then, or you can leave two cells in that one. And then once, you know, after seven days, you can leave two cells in that one, put a bottom on it and carry it off somewhere. Hmm. So, and yes, you just increased your hive. Because your migratory lid has like a piece that comes down over the side. So would that hole be exposed that way with the shim or no? The, the shim is underneath that blue box. Oh, okay. It's not, yeah, it's she, not up top. Okay, I was thinking it was on the top. Okay, I got oh, confused. It's, it's in here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. After your honey supers, your queen. Yeah, I, I screwed her. I screwed her up because I told her to take it off. So that's <laughs> that's why you're not seeing that. So, okay, I get it now. Because I, I didn't hear her say, you know, it's not supposed to have a screen in it, right? Because so, it was like, no, that's wrong. You, you want your bees to flow up and down, right? Yeah. Well, and that the was only for thing sugar board that's half inch holes, they can get through it, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't put it on there anyway. Right. Right. So yeah. this method is, is it best used with these gangbuster hives, as you call them? Yes. That's you the want to do it in a flow, mm -hmm. and it and it won't retard their honey production at all. It'll improve their honey. It'll production. increase it. It really will. Well, it's just because, like, when you do a um, a, a single brood chamber production, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. it increases it because. That's all the the frames that uh, the babies they have to take care of, and then everybody else yes. is bringing in honey oh, because no, they don't have anything else. Rhonda, to do. you can these two boxes get full. I can add another honey super. Yeah, oh, God. or if you don't have the equipment, you can bring it in, and hopefully you have a spinner. You can spin it out and put it back on. Put it right. Okay. Hopefully yeah. the same day if you're in a flow. I got yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah, wow. it's, it's very interesting. interesting. I, I'm yes. very excited. Yeah. To do my honey producers that way. Yeah, yeah. really. Because yeah. I want to ramp up honey production this year. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so. I mean, that's all we're in it for is just daily honey. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that looks like an awesome. No, I like pollination too. I like them to pollinate my gardens. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Yeah, that too. Yes. Well, since since we've been having bees where we're at, um, we have a friend that hikes daily and he, you know, tells everybody what they've seen and checks the cameras and everything because we have two leases. So he's the main guy on that. We call him our mayor. And <laughs> but he said, since we have been keeping bees, it's unbelievable the change of mass up there in the forest. And because it, you know, it's just pretty potent now. So it, it's, you know, it's amazing what bees My next door do. neighbor told me how much her, her garden changed when I moved. Yeah. Mine too. She, she couldn't believe the difference. Mm -hmm. She goes, and they're so mm -hmm. nice and gentle. They just love my Russian sage. Until they're not. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Until they're, they're not. not, yeah. I've seen some yeah. of those today on video too. <laughs> oh yeah, we've had some. And then we sit there and wait and try to find what hive they go to or crack them open. And then we say mean with a with this frowny face, and then we give them four tries. And you know, because there there might be things wrong. It might be a dearth, might be an a varmint, and you know they might not have a queen. So there's um I think I put on today 
um, how you know six, nine, six or nine ways you know your, your hive is queenless before going through it. So yeah, I, I found that very interesting. But so is but yeah. that not true? Like somebody, a friend of mine said that they had a they leased their property to a beekeeper. And I was saying how I'm gonna plant some stuff in my yard this year because I have four acres and it's not gonna be like right next to my hive. But she said that their beekeeper said there's no sense in planting stuff for the bees because they go two miles away to eat. They don't eat out of their own yard. They eat they out of their own yard. They'll eat right in front of their hive. That's right. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay, I my yard is there was truth to that. I just thought that was really strange, and I I'm like, well, well my bees eat from across the yard. Like I see yeah. them my up. bees don't have as bad of the dearth as some people do because I plant so much. <laughs> that's yeah. my goal. Yeah, that's my goal. I have tons well, of you stuff guys can plant. you can look into the NRCS. And that's what I was telling Emily the other day. And uh, we did it last year and they gave, we did four acres and they gave us about $3,000 worth of money. And our, our seed was 2,700 and, um, and we got reimbursed with, you have to pay for it up front. And so, and I just put mine on a credit card, gave them the receipts, they paid me right away and um, you know, not a problem. Um, but if you're interested in it, we have, we found a really good, um, seed place to where we bought ours. And because when we did this program, I sent my, uh, the list that they want you to buy from and, and use mm -hmm. from them, I sent it to Shanda and to analyze it. And she said, she wrote back to me and she said it was 76% grass feed. So, because they want the pollinators, they're not doing it for the honeybees. They're doing it for the pollinators. And so I told them, it was like, if I have to use this, I don't want it. And she's like, no, just say you are, it's fine. And so we did a, um, I, I got that little book that Rhonda, did you show it? Or Sue okay. showed the little um, book about plants. I think oh, Sue, I did. The hundred you did. Okay, well, well, I bought, I bought this book and it That's is absolutely society. wonderful and um, it's worth the money. It's not expensive. Yeah. That's That's local nice. libraries, guys, they may have it for you so that you I can have this. It. See, yeah. I had this read. That's what my, that's what I based my, um, my talk on. Yeah, I yeah. love that book. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. And it tells you okay. like if it's deer resistant or mm -hmm. bees like it or butterflies. And so it's great resources. Yeah, and it has them down under and the location where, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pointing this, yeah, where it grows. <laughs> and, it grows. Um, but if I would only be able to buy one book in the bee world, it would be that one right I there. I tried to get everybody to pick that up last year. I told Terry about it, Rhonda picked it up. Absolutely, it's great, great absolutely. Yeah. And and get it secondhand. You know, I, I'm sure you can find it cheap if your library doesn't have it. And um, yeah, so uh, who's the author? Uh, the it's the Exercise Exercise Society. Yes. Down the bottom. Can y'all see? That's Sorry. Okay. Back, but I'm perfect. glad. I'm glad you showed us because I would have never spelled that right. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and also later, I mean. Earlier, let me get my timing right. Um, I put on that moth killer that mm -hmm. you can spray your. I put it on our our Facebook page while Rhonda was talking. So, and it, mm -hmm. it's uh, I think up to twenty seven dollars. And if you guys, any of you live close together, you could um, you could buy it and uh, share it because you only use like a half a teaspoon or I think in a quart or something. Oh, yeah, wow. it's very. It goes forever. Oh, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, nice. Very nice. So back to the stupid beetles. I actually have a lot of those. Hive beetles? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Them little black things. I had yeah. a lot of them last year and I bought them stupid things that you put oil in and you put down in between your frames and yep. they didn't really work. Like, 
I honestly only had like five beetles in one and maybe three in the other. And every time I open the lid, the beetles scatter and it's right. gross because they look like cockroaches. <laughs> and I'm like, what the yeah. hell? Well, they're, they're worse than cockroaches. Them. Yeah, I do smash them. But okay. then somebody told me about the Swiffer uh -huh. dusting Sheet. pads. Yeah. But Swiffer where do sheets. you put those? In each corner. Yeah. You put them on top of the frames or down under on the entrance? I don't know how they look so far. Well, if you have, um, if you have, a, and you guys correct me because I, I don't use them, but an inner cover, mm -hmm. you can put them on top of the inner cover on each end. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, but you, you want to open. take them and you don't want, want them to smell. It's you know, non scented. And you want to take them and you want to rub them to make them fuzzy. And you will kill bees, but you won't kill a lot. So I, I tried them and I killed more bees than I did small hive beetles because I didn't really have them. Mm -hmm. you know, we, I went to a seminar and this guy did it and he, he puts them in a little Tupperware thing. So the beetles crawl in and you could always put um, like a little pollen patty if you had it in, yeah. in there for like a bait. Mm -hmm. And yeah, now I yeah, have. Definitely go after that. Yeah, yeah. So what but, yeah. do you guys use that's better? Because I did try it last year. And I, I don't have them. Bees in them. Oh, you don't have the beetles at I all? I don't. Well, I'm, I might see one. And oh. one hive might have two in them, and I I chase them down and kill them. But think, um, now when we were a lot in, of sunlight helps. Yeah, you, yeah. Are you in a lot of sunlight? I am, but I'm also right next to a river, and yeah, that's the moisture, the dampness. You got your yeah. moisture. I was going to ask that because I had one yeah. hive that had a lot of beetles, and then I helped with ventilation, and it it just basically corrected the problem. For well. Me. Now we were talking. You can get Kathy. What are those Neptunes or ne uh, nematodes? Beneficial nematodes. I was close. Nematodes, <laughs> and you can you can pour those in the front of your hive, and they go into the dirt. And then when the larva comes, the beetle lays the the egg or whatever, and it turns into a larva. It crawls out of the entrance and it falls down into the ground, and then it it mutates down in the ground, and those nematodes they eat that larva oh, okay yeah i but, was thinking about covering the ground under my hive to keep yeah. those larva from going in there yeah that's what i'm gonna do this year to yeah. try to just it would be really good that. to do it before uh winter is over so because they're gonna come out with a vengeance if you have that many as soon as it starts getting warm because they hibernate in there with the bees all winter okay. long okay yeah well so i'll do it then i'll do it this as soon as that, the weather permits i have this really thick heavy duty industrial plastic yeah. and i'm just yeah. gonna lay it on the ground as, as long as uh you know the the larva uh can't get through that but right that would yeah. work mm -hmm. would okay. you advise covering the ground before even putting like me getting my hops would you advise covering well we did in this new out yard we did just so we wouldn't have to weed eat so much close to them and right. we did road mat under them and then we set their thing there and um it's worked really well so i i would mm -hmm. i would definitely if you had it and why not you know as like make it wide enough that um because i have found in one section we didn't make it wide enough and it the wind blows it so it, it um I need to take maybe a torch and light it, you know, along the way and get stung while I'm doing it probably, but um, <laughs> because it, it's just, you know, they, they fray that stuff does. Yeah. So, but I, I do know um, that there's some at, at Walmart that I've bought, you know, just for my yard and um, it's probably wide enough, probably need to buy two of them. But we have the, like she does, the industrial, because my husband's a contractor and he makes roads and stuff. So we have that real long and it, it works really great, except for that frame. 
-hmm. I was looking at things at um, Tractor Supply one day because I thought about putting something under them and it's the, the pads that Lindsay uses to milk her cows on. Have you seen those great big, they're like heavy, I mean, they're super heavy and they're- Just like what they use in horse stalls. Probably. They might, yeah it's, yeah. it's like, they're they're probably like about yeah. that thick. Yeah, they use them in horse trailers. But I thought two of those would be awesome side by side mm -hmm. because I'm not gonna have a lot of hobs, mm -hmm. so, but they're super heavy and they're not real cheap either. So. Right. No, I, I don't think you have to go that expensive because you could lay this down and if you wanted to, you could pour gravel, mm -hmm. you right. know, just something. And and you can use um, Epsom salts, a little bit of dish soap and vinegar to spray underneath your, your bees if you wanted to. And when I was small, I, I did my fence, but now my fence is, you know, a whole field. So I can't do that. And it keeps the weeds down around my fence, but so does a weed whacker and it's cheaper. What do you ladies think about putting the cream of wheat on the ground for the piss ants? Someone told me to do that. And I I've tried never heard it. that. No, I've, I've, never heard heard of I've heard of cinnamon. cinnamon. We use organic cinnamon in our hives. Yeah. Um, well, someone said if you put the cream of wheat they eat it and then it expands in their gut and blows them up i'll let you know <laughs> <laughs> so i i do have piss ants too because mm -hmm. i mean I, my yard is right next to the river so mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. I, and i put the bees there so they'd have access to the water and because it's the most sunniest place mm-hmm and well, they they will fly two to three miles for water. So, yeah, if you can, if it's damp, then I think you need to move your bees and get them on a sunnier plateau mm -hmm. if you can. Well, or ants. Mm -hmm. or yeah, Emily, Emily, it's used for ants. Uh, sometimes they'll come into the like your top the top of your hive and you can sprinkle a little cinnamon in there and it'll i see them crawling up my hive i can see yep. a line sure. of crawling up the hive going up into it and i'm smashing them all but i don't mm -hmm. like it doesn't seem to get they don't seem to get too much in the hive because when mm -hmm. i open it i don't really see a lot of them i just see them crawling around on the outside more i've had some you know, some older lids and they get damp and they just love it and you go like this and it's just covered so I just take my hand glove you know gloveless whatever because they won't hurt you well they they bite sometimes but I just go like this and just have whole you know gobs of ants on dead ants on my hands because I would rather sacrifice myself than you know <laughs> let my my bees suffer with ants so and then they're you know they get in in the sides and they will eat your boxes oh they're, okay yep and it's not just the long lot you know like carpenter ants they those little ones they if it's any little bit of damp they're gonna tear your boxes up your equipment oh, so okay. you want to try to keep them out of there and and they aggravate the bees yeah I watched yeah. a video where people like if you build your frame with legs, they turn bowls upside down yes. and put water in them or whatever. And mm -hmm. then that way, the bees, when they climb up, they can't get up the leg of the stand the or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> I've seen that, but I wondered about um, and I've seen them put oil in it. And I've wondered about how many because bees are stupid. And I, I wonder know. how many bees have died in that. Well, not that so. moisture and just, you know, that wet i don't know right oh then yeah somebody said vaseline like you could put it around the legs if you have metal legs you could you know put vaseline around it because they won't climb that up would probably, yeah that makes sense so i guess you could put that on wood too i don't know i have to watch so many videos <laughs> oh i know i know they get monotonous after a while oh so yeah, yeah. what about the um i put a lot of hummingbird feeders around my yard too Mm -hmm. But I find a lot of bees that are inside them dead when I open them up, but they're hmm. not my honeybees. They're the other kind of bees. They're yellow jackets and stuff. That's I good. Kill everyone you can find. Absolutely. I smash them all day long. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Okay. Um, I just, I just want to make sure I'm not encouraging them by hanging. I have like five hummingbird feeders I hang through the yard. 
My right. honey for bird feeders don't get bad until the dearth. And dearth. then I have a problem. And then you know, go feed your bees. If there's a dearth. So it's a, it's a good thing to, to have at least one hummingbird feeder. So you, you know, can watch it. And when they're a, attacking it or won't leave it alone or coming around, you know, smelling it, then you need to, to see, you know, check your hives, see if they're heavy enough. And if they need fed, fed feed them. So. Okay. But, um yeah and but there's a there's a trap that uh, we all put out in the spring and mm -hmm. actually uh, do it the first of March if you can I can't get mine until the middle of March but you put that out there with this oh, where is like, um, yeah you got one and um but you want to catch oh. the queen because she's the only one that survives all through the winter Kathy's got one. She'll show well, you. I take it. I take a jug like this. My husband likes Hawaiian punch. And <laughs> I put a hole right here. And then all you put in there is um, red wine vinegar, a banana peel, sugar. I'll post it again. But you put it up really early. And yep. I actually hang it on one all of those. All over. Make many. Mm -hmm. I make a couple of them. And I have them near my vegetable garden, two near my beehives. You know those shepherd hooks? They're hanging up there and I don't care what they look like they work right so, um it'll get filled with, it gets filled disgusting with when it stinks so empty it stinks really. so bad and since he likes these so I save the jugs I throw that one away and I'll put up another one but you really want to get them up early and I'm going to remind Cheryl because Cheryl had a problem with robbers this year yep and, and you want to you want to catch it clean what um oh what about my honeybees are they going to be attracted to it they're no not the honeybees don't because uh, honeybees are herbivores basically and yellow jackets are carnivores and so they right. smell that rotten smell that's why you put the banana peel in there it attracts them and that's why they go in so that banana peel is super 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 important don't forget mm -hmm. to put that in and you can put a uh, piece of um lunch meat in there too because they love protein yeah right yeah because yeah. they're carnivores think of them yeah, as but you, know, you have it hanging out in the sun i'd rather have the the, the banana peel than the lunch meat <laughs> i i put them up high like in trees and yeah i put them all over my my out yards yeah, and they really you, when you see how many yellow jackets go in there and wasps yeah that, oh that yeah big yellow one uh yeah i uh, i put I put Ain't five that. out last year and I will probably do double that this year mm -hmm. because yeah. I, I have put, two out yards. Yeah. I will Just post the, I'll post them. I'll post it again. The, the recipe. The exact. Okay. It's Thanks. Like a half I would have to sugar. hunt for it. That'd be yeah. great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I definitely need that. I have all kinds. I have carpenter bees. I have wasp nests on the top of my house. I have yellow jackets and I'm always watching my hive to make sure they don't get in it. Oh yeah, they'll they'll devastate them. Um, Cheryl lost two last year. Uh, she got she really got yeah. I think it was too high. She was devastated. She yep. she didn't know oh, that's that's right. Right. nothing happening. you can do. Too late. Yeah, Tam, uh, look on Facebook. She'll post it there on our page. I'll post it on the woman's page if I get. I, I'll try to do it tonight. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, can't stress it enough. I, I have one other question you guys might not have seen. It's a uh, Japanese beetle trap that I found. Mm -hmm. Because it's a trap, it's not a poison. And I just hang it and it has yep. like a, a thing in it that smells real good. And they fly to it and they drop in the bag and then they can't get out. I use right. them all the time. It but works you don't amazing. Put, I use them all the time, but you don't put them close to your plants that you're trying to to get the Japanese beetles away from because you just lure them to your plants. So hang them away from that your makes body. sense. Mm -hmm. okay. Are the bees attracted to that though? I wondered no. about that because we just took the, one down today. And no, the bees aren't way. attracted to that kind of pheromone because I have them hanging everywhere and they don't bees don't get anywhere near them. Yeah, because oh, it smells it has a sweet smell to it. You it's know a weird smell, yeah. It, it is it's different. I wondered right. about that the though. That's good. When the bag fills with beetles, it stinks terribly. Yes, I know. Oh, I'm sure. Dead. 
<laughs> I, that's why you throw them away. <laughs> it worked last year, but I was not opening that bag to look in there and see if there was any bees in there, even though I was a little if worried. You keep on, you, if you keep on using those traps, after a while, you won't need them as much because you kind of diminish the population. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't need them as much as I used to. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I need them in my high tunnel. They found it. No, it was on my on my mint. They were all over my mint this year, last year. I've never had them on mint. Huh. And then, you know, those um, fire bushes that I have coming up my driveway, mm -hmm. they were all over them. And huh. it didn't even have buds on it or anything. They were eating the leaves. Wow. Yeah. So person? I am on the war path from Japanese beetles and what well, and well. A lot of times the yellow jacket and Amy told us this. Amy, what's her name? D it's Italian. The ga the gallo. Gallo. Yeah, something like that. Um thank you, there it is. There thank it is. You. I, I had the D right and, and the O. Um but anyway, she's a she's on our on our group and um but she was telling us and what the heck was I talking about? Talking about bees and beetles and traps and no shoot. What did Amy tell me? Hmm. Summer. Oh, I okay. Ding ding ding. Um, <laughs> it looks like a yellow jacket, but it's a paper wasp that looks just like a yellow jacket. Mm -hmm. And so I had after she told me and I looked it up, I had more. Uh, paper wasp than I had yellow jackets and they look identical except for their body is just a, a different shape hmm. just just enough that if you saw side by side you could say who was what so look look both of those up and, and teach yourself and if you have your bee glove on which I do it with my finger because they are easy to kill but you just go and I'll do this you just go like that and they're dead yep just, I do just go like that long. and <laughs> yep one Two time yellow I, legs <laughs> yeah i had um i killed 30 up in my um i had some uh wax that i was getting ready to melt you know which is wet with honey and they were they were in there and um so i, I went around and i i killed i didn't i don't kill honey or uh, bumblebees but i do kill yellow uh the yellow jackets like paper wasps I'll tell you something so, we have trouble with too is mud daubers. They're horrible yeah. because we yeah, live yeah. close to a creek and uh -huh. they, did you know that they take spot live spiders up into their mud? We yes. didn't know that. We knocked one of them down and a bunch, I mean, of live spiders. They hold them there to feed their babies. I, I was like, wow. this is so Ew, weird. That's so I, and they, yes. and they, all these live spiders fell out of this mud. And I'm thinking that is strange yeah but i found them and i have found them in my um hives before and they just coexist and i was like what the heck and we had some trouble with those and then we ended up having to spray and then i told my husband i said we're not going to be able to spray anymore because of the bees but mm -hmm. we got rid of all of that all the spiders because they were a problem well and okay so let me tell you about spraying i'm you know organic as it comes if i can be for the price that it's becoming right. but i with spraying around your bees if you spray before it blooms and you don't get a drift on top of your bees you can go and cover your bees and spray very early in the morning and spray late at night where you know they're not going to be out and it can be done if you use your head and do it correctly see we only spray like around the perimeter of our house anyway just right, right. around the outside and up where the fine. eaves are at and we yep. were going to do it this month being the weather's like yeah so nice because no, we only we only spray once every three months anyway so mm -hmm. yeah I, I was worried about that because I thought I don't want to do anything and then land on it the residue yeah, and ended no. up killing my bees so well, I yeah. live in, I used to live in New Jersey and they would do aerial sprays. Oh, right. They would notify me before an aerial spray. So what I do is I take a wet sheet and cover my hives. Yep. Keep they them notify you first. They That's notify you. Huh? They, they notify you. Yeah. Because I put myself on a list. So before they did any aerials, and they notify We have that. 
-hmm. We have that list now in West Virginia and yes. Field Watch. Yep. Yeah. Is what so well, I know uh, they to, drop they drop rabies pellets and they don't warn you about that. Oh gosh. Lindsay, yeah. Huh. That's not okay. No, um, it's not okay. Because they smell like maple syrup. Oh my and goodness. Your oh. cow would eat them in a heartbeat. And it's not, I mean, they just they just randomly drop them on your property. Wow. Okay. Well, this is being recorded, remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I well, don't know how to edit. <laughs> well, I'm Maybe just saying that they they do yeah. they do that. They do. I mean, it's hmm. hard. I don't even who do, I don't know who does it, but it's to keep the rabies count down or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's my latest organic thing. <laughs> what is it? My latest organic thing to do. Copper nails. Oh, wow. I bet that's expensive. They weren't really. They weren't that expensive. Huh. I paid $14 for 12 of them. They're more than a dollar a piece, but you drill the autumn olive in the rocks. You know, I could do um, chemicals to kill it, but all I do is drill a little hole, tap that in, and it's going to kill that stupid root. So you get yeah, your. The bees love autumn olive. She has I have a lot it. of it. She's, she's <laughs> I have swamped a tremendous with it. amount of it. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I mean, like, she she can kill some. <laughs> I, they tell you it's so invasive. They tell you not to burn it or cut it. I cut down two trees and they're just interwined in, in the rocks and everything else. So I'm down the roots to that, especially today with a with a hand drill and these things. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. That's impressive. Good to know. Huh. Yeah. I never knew it before, too. I said, wow. Kathy's really? our master gardener. She just mm -hmm. passed right, her. I got my badge on, I just got back to my meeting. Oh, shoot. I was going to tease you about that. It was like, this <laughs> Kathy giving her presentation. <laughs> Very good. Does anybody else have any questions? We could, we could stay on here forever. Yeah. Right, ladies? I have been yeah. running all day. <laughs> yeah. I've been sitting and reading all day. Watching the wind blow. Gardens. My um, my freezer died. So oh, you know, shoot. My, you know. So now it's a box. You know, it's in this freezer box. Yeah, your frames. It's airtight. <laughs> it's perfect. And I got another freezer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very cool. And Bethany, how are you doing, sweet girl? She's uh, in her room. You still yeah. in your room? Yep, I'm in bed. Yeah, she just had surgery. Oh, you okay? So she's recouping. Yeah, yep. Hide, hiding out in my room as much as possible. Doing Sle good. Slept a lot yesterday, so. Oh, that, I bet. That anesthesia knocks me out. Yeah. 